hearts. Thank you. Some of you are from South Carolina, Tennessee, Idaho, Northern California. We're grateful. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and this is really our anniversary as a church globally. So we're sensing even now because we just said, Lord, your presence is all we want. And I'm going to ask for you who are here, we're going to just step out in faith because we believe that as the scripture said in the book of Acts, when the early church was open to the leading of the Lord, that the grace of God was there to heal. The presence of the Lord was there in power. So I believe he's here. We are believing, we're people who believe that in the omnipresence of God. He's not here 20% or 30%. He's here 100%, like in the burning bush experience with Moses. So I'm trusting that you will step out in faith with me. I'm going to invite you to team up with another person, men with men, ladies with ladies. And let's just speak the name of Jesus. If there is a healing that you need on your body, would you trust the Lord to use you to pray? In Jesus' name, be healed. It will not take long. It's not even in the words. It's just an act of faith where Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you. Do you believe? But it's really the power of God. And you say, well, I've, I've never prayed for anybody like that. I, I don't even know if my prayers really matter. I'll tell you, the weaker you are, the greater the glory of God. So it's going to take an opportunity for you to just say, this is what I need. Sometimes mental illness really needs to be healed. Sometimes people are having bursitis and they just, they feel like, man, arthritis is happening. Just tell them what it is. Don't go into explanation. God knows. We're giving you an opportunity just to team up with somebody and say, would you just pray? And if you say, I've never prayed out loud, then I ask all of you just to end your prayer or the prayer in silence in the name of Jesus. Just in the name of Jesus. So, dear friends, dear guests, welcome to Hope Chapel. But let's take a moment now, men with men, ladies with ladies. It's going to be brief. It's going to be quick. Let's team up now. Okay, 30 seconds more. Let's see if we can end that prayer
Father, we want to thank you for answering the prayers of your people. Thank you, Lord, that you see our hearts, you see our faith. So, Lord, we just speak the name of Jesus. We're believing that even within this hour, as your word says, within the hour, they were healed. So, Lord, as we're in your presence, thank you for completing that healing today. We know with men it is impossible, but not so with God, for with God all things are possible, you said in Mark 10, 27. So we thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Way to go, everyone. Well, can we thank our worship team for just leading us into a wonderful expression? Thank you, thank you. Well, today, today is the anniversary of the birth of the church for Christianity. Today is called Pentecost. And by way of introducing the video clip that you're about to see in leading into the message, I want to just encourage you, get your bulletin cards, get your Bible ready. But we are wanting to remind you, what is Pentecost? Well, there are three high holy days of Christianity. Those three are... Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost. Those are the three. Now, it is interesting to note, sometimes like Pentecost, what is that? And I just went right through that. So you can see what an impact that commercializing a holiday might be because it's kind of like putting pressure on the church globally to celebrate Christmas because there's so much festivity. The same with Easter. Like, look what Easter has become. But Nevertheless, it's wonderful that society recognizes those two holidays, those holy days. But Pentecost is equally as impacting. Traditionally, historically, Pentecost was marked by God in the Old Testament to remind the nation of Israel that 50 days after they celebrated the first Passover, when they were released from Egypt in the wilderness wandering, 50 days after that Pentecost was to be celebrated in a reminder that God is when he gave the laws to the nation of Israel, the Ten Commandments. And that the second thing that Pentecost signaled was that it was reminding that nation that God is a covenant, he's in a covenant with them, and he promises his presence among them. And the third thing about Pentecost, historically, traditionally, It was the beginning of the harvest season. For you and me, we know when Jesus said that the fathers promised the coming of that gift called the Holy Spirit. That's when the church was birthed on Pentecost. It's amazing how God in his word is fulfilling these Old Testament holy days. Feast of trumpets, hey, I think that's when the rapture is going to happen. There were true Feast of Trumpets. How's that? But when we talk about Pentecost, that's the fulfillment as well because it was Jesus that said to his followers in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, he says, I now call you Peter, and it's upon this rock I'm going to build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I'm very encouraged by those words. I'm encouraged because you and I belong to Jesus. He claims us. I'm going to build my church. He names us. That word church is that element of who we are, called out ones from society. So it's pretty wonderful that he even calls us that he's going to protect us. The gates of Hades are not going to prevail. But today is Pentecost, and It is in Acts chapter 2 that the fulfillment was, and that's when the birth of the church took place. Well, we're going to encourage ourselves because the message is all about the, the overflow of that, but let's take a look at the video clip to remind us, happy Pentecost Sunday. disciples are waiting, waiting on a promise, a promise of a new kind of baptism, not of water, but of the Holy Spirit. Today, the church was born. The Spirit fell like fire, and a power like no other was revealed, a power of prophecy, a power of visions and dreams. 
people from every nation under heaven, hearing the disciples declare the wonders of God in tongues they never spoken, hearing the gospel in their own language. This is Pentecost, a time of signs and wonders, a time of fellowship and prayer, a day to cry out to Jesus, a day to repent and be baptized, a day to ask for forgiveness and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is Pentecost. God gets me so excited when I think about today's that day because I have been influenced by that Pentecostal experience. And as a pastor, I'm wanting everyone to experience the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And that's what today's message is all about. I'm trusting that you're going to get your bulletin card. Please make sure you have something to write with. I'm going to be giving you some verses in addition to what you'll be seeing as well online. You do want to take a look at that. As a pastor, the privilege I have is to disciple people. That's what Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples. What a joy that is. Man, there's some great things happening on the water's edge of our, of our shores. Baptized California, how about it? Well, those same individuals are going to be needing to be discipled, and that's where you come in. That's where you come in and say, hey, there's another blessing for you, and it's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, I want to just take a moment here because it is interesting when we deal with this subject matter, we do need to tell people quite often about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we forget. Have you ever found people that forget or they just are hard to hear and they just don't hear? They just don't hear. Heard about a guy who showed up on Monday morning to work and he had two big sets of gauze bandages on both ears. And the buddy said, dude, what happened? He said, you know, I was ironing my shirts and the phone rang and I picked up the iron by mistake oh he said and I was in such pain he said what what he said yeah I was in such pain that I had to call the paramedics <laughs> sometimes we just don't hear nor do we kind of remember or we learn by our mistakes so let's believe and hear some things that the word of God has for us today that's so important for us so important to see some things in the scriptures laid out how vital it is for Christians born again, going to heaven, needing to see and sense and be filled with the second blessing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We do want you to be able to hear. We do want you to understand. I want you to see and perceive. And I believe if you catch this, it's a miracle of God. Sometimes we just assume as Christians, well, we don't need to tell people to get water baptized. We don't need to tell people they should tithe. Well, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 14, how will they believe unless somebody tells them? Yes, it's important that we just need to tell people these essentials of their faith and following of the word of the Lord. I like that, don't you? So we need a breakthrough. Some of us, we know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some of us have been filled. We know we had a legit experience, but we just don't spend much time praying in the Holy Spirit. We don't spend much time praying in that wonderful language. Therefore, let the Lord help us. And I'm going to pray for us right now, and I'm going to pray in the Spirit, which means I'm going to pray in tongues. And maybe if this is the first time you've ever heard anybody pray in the Spirit, praise God. I'm glad it happened here at Hope Chapel. But we know this, that whoever prays in the Spirit is communicating to God. Their spirit is praying, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. 1 Corinthians 14, 14, my spirit's praying. So let me pray for the message. Let me pray for you. And the Holy Spirit knows how he's going to direct us. I'm excited. So, Lord, thank you. As we open our hearts today, once again, you're such a good teacher. Lord, will you move in our hearts? Will you pull back fatigue? Will you eliminate contentions? Will you help us to see? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you. Now, let's begin 
It is interesting to know, I find that the Bible changes lives. This is a spiritual book. You do not go at this book by mere intellect or somehow as mere study material or somehow just a curiosity. If you're here just curious about things, then, then that's nice to be exposed. But man, if you're wanting change lives and you want to experience the Lord since he's a spirit, you really got to get into him and say, I want all that God has. And that's what and how I experienced the infilling Holy Spirit. I was so radically observable change when I accepted Christ, that somebody said, you need the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I said, really? Well, if that's anything like getting saved, count me in. Yes, Total ignorant. Now I get a chance to try to walk people through to help people to realize I also need to be filled with the Spirit and obey God's Word. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his classic, the book entitled The Cost of Discipleship, said this, about the Bible. It is so hard to believe because it's so hard to obey. He went on to say that our time reading the Bible without a readiness to obey the word ultimately cultivates a hardening of our own heart to resist the spirit. I don't want that, do you? I don't want that. After a while, it's like, man, I haven't picked up my Bible, doesn't do anything, doesn't move me. Lord, give me a hunger and change me. I want to experience you. And that's what we're about to do, and I'm glad about that. So let's take a look. When we deal with something like this, this should be the norm for the church of Jesus around the globe. The norm that people who are followers of Jesus are filled with the Spirit. Our founder of the Four Square Movement, her name is Amy Simple McPherson. She said that the end of the church age should never be weaker than at the beginning of the church. Makes sense to me. We should have more people filled with the Spirit, moved with signs and wonders and prophetic words than ever before. But maybe somebody's just not telling about this extra blessing about being filled with the Spirit. So I'm glad we get a chance to do that. Let's begin. Number one, you see on your notes, spiritual language is a gift of the Holy Spirit. We talk about a gift, that means you don't earn it. You don't try to deserve it. It is something like salvation. It says that it is a gift from God, not of works. So just like you determine to receive Christ, it's the same where you say, you know what, maybe I should receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit to be one that helps move the kingdom of God and advance it. Let's take a look at some of these things, answering some of the concerns and maybe doubts or maybe dispelling some things of uncertainty. But letter A, the gift of speaking in tongue, other tongues follows salvation. That's an important one because oftentimes people will say, didn't I get the Holy Spirit when I believed? Yeah. Well, why do I need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Because there's a second grace that's there. Let's take a look. Let the Bible speak to us. We want the Bible to speak to us. Why? Because I have dear friends in this community. We call them fundamentalists. Fundamentalists say, you know what? We're going to just stick with the Bible. We don't need the charismatic movement. We don't need that tongue stuff. We got the full revelation of the word. Well, if that's the case, let's let the word speak. How many say amen? Amen. Good job. So let's go and dive right into that. Let's open up. I'm going to say some verses. Some I will share with you online. But it's in John chapter 13. You can just write that down. In verse 1, where Jesus is in the Last Supper. You know, in the Gospel of John, there's really just 21 chapters. The first 11 are all the life of Jesus. Can you imagine that? The latter part of that Gospel is all about the last week of Jesus. I wonder what the Heavenly Father wants you to know. Your redemption is there what he's talking about. But in John 13, 1, Jesus tells them, he says, hey, the Passover is now, and I'm going to be, he says, I'm going to go to my father. I'm going to part this world. My time is at hand. I'm leaving you. And the disciples are rocked. What? Why are you leaving us? That's where you get in John 14, 1. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. 
If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. But there's something more that was to their advantage, and it was the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus was talking about. So we have in John 13, I'm just making reference, verse 36, Peter says, where are you going? They're still digging at it. And why can't we go there, John 13, 37? Where are you going and why can't we go? So he starts to lay out the importance of that and describes to them, and we'll pick it up in John chapter 16, verse 7. And let me show you this. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, another helper, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him, Holy Spirit, to you. Now, I'm reading from the New King James rendering. Most of you have that, I hear. I often use the New Living Translation, but most of these verses will be from the New King James rendering. But let's take a look here. Jesus is saying, I'm going to, it's going to be to your advantage. That's what he's telling them. How could it be? They are puzzled. Have you ever heard somebody say, I'm leaving you and it's good riddance for you? No, no. Why would it be to their advantage? You're thinking, how could somebody who's multiplying the fish and loaves, resurrecting dead people and opening the eyes of the blind, how could that be to our advantage? And he says, if I don't go away, the helper will not come. I'm going to send another, another, one just like me, but not me. I'm going to send another, one just like me, but not me. And he says he's going to be your help. I love that term. I love that title. So this is after the resurrection. We're going to scoot on just a little bit. I'm now in John chapter 20. Remember, it's after the resurrection. The disciples are fearful for their lives. They don't want to be arrested by the authorities nor by the religious leaders that did not like Jesus. And Jesus shows up in the locked room. And check out what he says here. John 20, verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now let me explain. Here we go. He breathed on them, received the Holy Spirit. Some people say, well, see, we all got the Holy Spirit when we got saved. This, in fact, is where they got born again. This is where their spirit that was dead, remember Jesus said, except a man be born again of the spirit, he's not going to see the kingdom. You won't understand it. You can't see it. You can't determine what is this book about. He breathes on them, receive the Holy Spirit. In that word emphaseo, we get our word emphysema. There's only one other time. It's in the Septuagint where God breathed into man, and it was into Adam. And Adam became a living soul. Sin came in and corrupted that. Jesus and the resurrection comes in. Receive the Holy Spirit. They get born again. But now we're going to see they still need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's where we come in. That's where your church happens to be birthed on the day of Pentecost. That's where you become more intriguing and more engaging in humanity. See, we don't want you just to go home to heaven and have your place there, and it's going to happen. We want you to be world changers, convincers, declarers. And it's not your doing. It's the Holy Spirit if you open your heart to him. So as we see here in Acts chapter 1, let's move on. Why is it called Acts? It's the Acts of the Apostles. It's the beginning of the church. It's history for us. It's important that we see these things or else it doesn't quite make sense when you talk about speaking in tongues and the day of Pentecost. But you see here in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, we see something where all of a sudden, in verse 3, as I look up, it says that Jesus went about for 40 days showing himself. 40 days. So that's pretty important. And Pentecost lands on the 50th day following Passover. So you can imagine 
when Jesus says something like this, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise, capital P, of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Wait a minute, wait, I thought, didn't Jesus just say, receive the Holy Spirit? What's going on? See, a lot of people are like, how do you reason that one? But he's saying there's another great blessing for Christians. And God knew better, and he recognized that. They were all united. You read your chapter 1 of Acts, chapter 14, or chapter, excuse me, 1, verse 14 and 15. There's 120 of them remaining. Everybody else took off. And all 120 are going to get filled with the Spirit and speak in tongues. It's a beautiful thing. You mark that down, Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost. It is a large crowd in Jerusalem. It is traditionally the beginning of harvest. People from every nation who is a God-fearing person comes in there. Talks about the different languages. The Holy Spirit comes down, shaboom. I kind of like that because in Acts 1, 14, Acts 1, verse 14 and 15, it says that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was in the crowd. I kind of tell that to my relatives, that Mary was, she was Pentecostal. Anyway, I just want to throw that out there. What are you saying there, Brother Paul? I, well, I'm just saying. That's, so it's important that we get a chance to see that, but look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Remember shy Peter who denies the Lord three times? There's something about not having the Spirit of God, nor being really transformed. We quiver. We entertain lies. It's a spiritual realm. You and I know that. Things we know we should do, I can't do it. I can't do it. The Spirit of God comes on Peter, and we have his whole sermon, Acts chapter 2. Not very long. You can read the whole thing. And 3,000 people receive Christ and get baptized. But look what he says, because he's talking about you and me here. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive, look at that word, the gift. You shall receive the gift. God's got a gift for you. And that gift is the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises to you and to your children... Promises to you who hear me and to the generations to follow. Those kiddies out there, get them filled with the Spirit. Get the children filled with the Spirit. Man, this is the hour. This is the day. How could they come against all that element of darkness and deception and twisting of what's true? Unless the Holy Spirit who speaks truth to them. But back to our text. This promise, what promise? The Holy Spirit. This promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Dear Lord, please call everyone who's listening to me now. Please call. Let them hear that call. Just like they heard the plan of salvation and said, I believe, I receive. Lord, fill them. Fill them with a heart for the call be filled with the Spirit. So we take a look here. It's important we get a chance. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a second step from salvation. But let's go ahead just a little bit more. Let's show another text where that happened, where people got born again, but a little later they got filled with the Spirit. Here we go. So when you take a look in the book of Acts, persecution hits the early church. They are loving large gatherings. They're just going for it. They're in Jerusalem. The apostles are there. But God said, go into all the world, preach the gospel. God says, you're going to be my witnesses to Judea and Samaria and the other most parts. But they're hanging tight until persecution happens, and then they scatter. And Philip is one of these guys. We have a note here in Acts chapter 8 where Philip goes down to Samaria. Now, he's running for his life like all the rest of them, but Philip is one of those guys who is nothing more than a table waiter. 
he gets the name eventually Philip the Evangelist. But Philip gets his call in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Remember where there was a dispute over food distribution? And the apostles say, well, just to hand out food, we're going to need some people with these qualities. Make sure they have a good reputation. Make sure they are filled with the Spirit. Make sure they've got some wise thoughts. They're walk in wisdom. Those three categories. Philip's one of those dudes. And now Philip goes out, and he's in Samaria. Remember, we've heard stories how Jews and Samaritans just don't get together that much. That story of the Good Samaritan helping a Jew. So we take a look here. It's in Acts chapter 8. Check out what he does when he gets into town. One guy filled with the Spirit. Verse 5, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. What was he talking about? Isn't that be great? When was the last time he just talked about Jesus in some setting? Man, it's got to be something of the Holy Spirit that says, hey, by the way, I got something good for you. In verse 6, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did for unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. Doesn't that sound just like what we went through with the Holy Spirit and You series? And we just finished this series on understanding ways to fight a spiritual enemy. Philip had these amazing things happening, and you know, we're finding some of our missionaries when they go into third world nations, and there's demons in those regions who have not heard the name of Jesus, maybe ever, or for years. When those missionaries go in and start speaking about Jesus, they manifest. They get tripped out. And here we see an account. Now in Orange County, some of the demons that kind of get a little creeped out here, but they've heard Jesus all the time, but there's no power in the person speaking it. They could just sit there and be as nice as they can. If Satan can show up in the upper room and enter into Judas, he can certainly come into Hope Chapel here and be very polite. So the seven sons of Sceva, remember we read that? Remember that? They tried to say, hey, man, we adjure you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. What? So come on, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, boys and girls. Let's get the Holy Spirit. Because there's impact and power when confronting areas of darkness. And they're out there. Yes, sir. So when we see here, verse 8 in our text, and there was great joy in that city. Sounds like a revival, doesn't it? Yeah. Wouldn't you be like, whoa, doesn't everybody? Well, let's go see the big top show. Something big's going to happen for God. Let's just sit and watch. But here is something is taking place, and there's great, it's like a revival. I think we're on the start of one here in our city. I'm thinking here, it's pretty exciting. Paul, when he gets born again in Acts 19, 1 through 7, remember Paul goes to Ephesus, and there's 12 little followers, and he asks them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Can you imagine how incredible is that? When he goes down there and asks, have you received the Holy Spirit? I wonder if he were to come into the doors here and say, man, I am digging this worship in here. You must be all spirit-filled and speak in tongues. He might ask us something like that. But check out what happened. Revival in Samaria. We're in Acts chapter 8 still. Look at, go down to verse 14. And it says, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive what? Everybody read that. Receive what? They're sending the two big guns, Pete and John John. To do what? Well, it goes on. It says, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them. How many looked at? And they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had laid hands on them. And they received the Holy Spirit. Now look at the sequence here. 
when the apostles who were at Jerusalem, it was so important to them, like it is for our church, like it is for you. When we hear, you got born again, you got water baptized on the coast? Man, let's get you what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. What's that? I thought I'm good to go. So we see here, they sent Peter and John to them who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Look at the scripture. For as yet he, not it, the Holy Spirit's not an it. You don't say that thing's a creature. No way. Don't offend God. For as yet he had fallen upon how many of them? I, two, somebody's not raiding. How many did, how many did the whole... Holy Spirit fall on who were water baptized? None. That's why we encourage people to be filled with the Spirit a little bit later, maybe after the water baptism. He had fallen on none of them. They had only been baptized. If you've only been water baptized, if you haven't even been water baptized, no wonder why things are closing off. It's walk in obedience. But we can see here, they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Letter B, the Holy Spirit of God is involved in the gift of tongues. Why would I even say that? There are still some thoughts out there, and then they, we verbalize it. Well, you know, you don't want to speak in tongues. That's probably an evil spirit. It's going to probably be something. But that's why we have Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. The Word doesn't change. So it's important for us, as we look at Luke chapter 8, 11, verse 13, one of my lovable key verses, but in Luke 11, remember where Jesus is talking, he says, hey, you, you crowd out there, if your children ask for bread, are you going to give them a stone? Or if you're going to ask for maybe some, a fish, are you going to give them a snake? No, naturally. And if you ask for an egg, will you give them a scorpion? Then he says this, if you then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your own children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? All it takes is just, Lord, I would like to have the Holy Spirit come fill me. That's all it really takes. How much more so? If we who are not perfect parents still want to do the best we can for our kiddos, how much more so will you? And it was important in that day so that people didn't realize, well, this must be some weird, whacked group of people. It is the Holy Spirit, not some evil spirit. So, because there's strong opinions out there and it fosters fear, don't let it happen. I love Luke chapter 11, verse 10. That's where he says, and everyone who asks receives. Don't you love that? Matter of fact, let's even say that. For everyone who asks, for everyone who asks, that's right, for everyone who asks, receive. Everyone means who? Oh, just ask. So 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, it's important that we take a look when a person is filled and they start to pray in their prayer language. It says, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. So what is a person doing when they're speaking in tongues? They're speaking to God. That's what the Bible says. For no one understands him. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries. You go down to verse 14, we'll flash that one as well. It says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. So I just pass that along. Speaking in tongues, it's not an evil spirit. Speaking in tongues, you're actually doing something great. You're praying. We know biblically the interpretation of somebody speaking in tongues is either a prayer or a praise. We hear them speak the wonderful works of God. So an interpretation of a tongue would be a prayer to God or a praise. That would be a true interpretation if you got that interpretation. But it's a mystery because we don't know what we're actually saying. That's why it's important there's many times, just like I demonstrated, praying for this message, prayed in the Spirit, just going to let the Holy Spirit speak to you, to your doing, to your life, to your journey, your relationship with God. There's many times, I don't know what, for example, my son Luke might be dealing with in Billings, Montana. 
you know, as parents, we always pray, Lord, bless them, keep them safe, make them just really prosperous and rich, and maybe he'll take care of me when I'm old and great. But, or we don't know what he actually needs, and we go and pray in the Spirit but I don't know what I'm praying, and I probably am grateful for it. Because if I knew what I was praying, I probably wouldn't pray it. I'm praying, bless him, help him. And then I pray in the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit says, Father, you just heard Paul's prayer. Cancel it out. Line it out. Make sure Luke gets double flat tires, have his engine block freeze on him, put him in financial straits so that he knows to lean on God. I wouldn't pray that. But you can see the impact that praying makes, and we'll show just a little bit. Letter C, praying with the laying on of hands is the pathway. Now, I have a little simple prayer on your bulletin card. You could just go home. I'm just going to ask God because everyone who asks receives. But there's something powerful about laying on of hands. That person is filled with the Spirit. They'll transfer that great gift since the day of Pentecost, seems to be. I've got some that will just list there on Acts chapter 8, verse 17. They laid hands on them. Acts chapter 9, verse 17, laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, same God who appeared on the road of Damascus, has sent me to give you your eyesight back and to fill you with the Spirit. Ooh, but it had to be a transfer. Why didn't God, by a big old angel, just drop it on him? He uses you. He uses you. He uses you. Then we have Acts 19.6. Paul laid hands on them. There's only two times we see where there was not a laying on of hands. That's the day of Pentecost. Boom. Tongues of fire. Sounds of like a freight train coming through. And the other one was Acts chapter 10. Cornelius' house. Cornelius gets a visitation of an angel. Go get for Peter. And Pete shows up, say, you guys are like Gentiles. I don't mingle with you. But it's the infilling of the Holy Spirit for the Gentiles, which means non-Jewish people. There's no laying on of hands there. Let's move just a little bit. Benefits of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Letter A, I alluded to this. Holy Spirit allows us to pray beyond our understanding. I find that so impacting, so beneficial that I get built up by faith when I pray in the Spirit, but I see things move that I did not anticipate, and it's always a right direction. I like what Romans chapter 8, verse 26 says, we have a weakness, and the Holy Spirit's there to help in that weakness. Let's let the Word speak to us. Likewise, it's Romans 8, 26. The Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. I've got weaknesses. Anybody else have a weakness? Here's one of them. It's just listing one of them. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Pretty powerful. When was the last time you prayed for your relative in the Spirit? Lord, I know you've got a good will. I want to just know what that is. I'd like to cooperate with that, Lord. But pray for them in tongues. You get built up when you do that. You take a look. Now let me add First John chapter 5, verse 14. Every time I just believe, I pray in tongues for you or for others or for a situation... I get my prayers answered because the Bible says so. Here's it. In verse 14, 1 John 5, and this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he, we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of him. Romans 8, 26, Holy Spirit helps in our weakness. We do don't know what the will of God is. I might as well pray it in the Spirit. 1 John 5, 14, you've got it. It's coming. It's going to be answered. Pretty powerful. Pretty powerful. When was the last time you prayed in the Spirit over a subject matter or your own future? 
You need to consider that. Your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done. I'm not quite sure what it is. I haven't read the Bible in a long time, but I'm sure we're going to pray in the Spirit. Have that happen. So here we go. Let her be. Holy Spirit allows us to obey beyond our understanding. Oh, I like that. One of the things that I found in my own life as a shy young man, and I was very shy, was that the Holy Spirit coming upon me was a game changer. Everybody liked me because little Paul's such a nice little kid. He never talks. He never, I, I would just, I didn't know what to say. But we see here in John chapter 14, verse 12, most assuredly, Jesus says, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And Philip goes to Samaria and unclean spirits are coming out and paralyzed and lame people are getting healed. Who does that stuff? You can do that if you let the Holy Spirit allow you to just say, go over there, say some things here. Pretty powerful. We really have a bored generation, a bored. You ever hear kids like, you know, what's for dinner, Mom? Not that again. That's so boring. What are we going to do today? Ah, yeah. yeah, not that. Come on, Dad. Spice it up a little bit. We're bored. I'm telling you, you get people filled with the Spirit, and it's a journey of great things to come. But something seems to be missing lately, and it's the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And it's so important. Let's take a look at just Jude. We'll go to Jude 20. Read down. Jude chapter 1, just before the book of Revelation, says this, But you, beloved, build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. I tell you, if you're feeling dilapidated, you feel uninspired, you feel like maybe those gifts of God have left you, pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Get filled with the Spirit if you're not. Pray in the Spirit you might find that you don't have enough energy to blow the fuzz off a peanut if you get filled with the Spirit. I tell you, when you speak about Jesus, people are going to be, their hearts will melt. It's the Holy Spirit in you. Holy Spirit in you. Finally, let her see. Holy Spirit allows us to praise beyond our understanding. I don't want to watch other people get excited and enthusiastic for God. I want to jump in on that. Don't you want to just like, how come I'm feeling nothing? Well, it's important in John chapter 4, verse 23. Remember, whoever, when we see in the Bible that somebody speaks in a tongue, doesn't speak to men, but to God. So it's a prayer language. We hear them speak the wonderful works of God. It's a praise language. So here in John 4, 23, but the hour is coming, and now is, Jesus says, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Well, that's pretty exciting. And when we take a look at that, I just want to add one last thing as we wrap this up. I like the fact, and I now speak to you who have been filled with the Spirit, you know something legitimately happened to you when you had somebody pray for you. You're hungering for that, but you feel very dry. You need to go back to just pray in tongues. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. I'm going to highlight that where it just says, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. I want to just, for some of our young upstart Christians, we know what it was like when we just had a six-pack to kind of numb our sorrows through a heavy work week. And then getting drunk, some of you might recall, it's just, it's a counterfeit to the Holy Spirit. Getting drunk, basically, remember that? You felt relaxed, you're a little more carefree, a little more calm, maybe a little more courageous. Joyful in heart, maybe ready to take some risks, maybe not so good risks. But the Holy Spirit does the same thing. 
Bible says, do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. Don't go after the counterfeit. Man, go after the real deal. Go after the real deal. Get filled with the Spirit. Well, I am filled, but I'm feeling like nothing. Here's how. You got to speak. You got to speak. It's what the Bible says. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another. Speaking. Everybody say speaking. Speaking. Say speaking. Speaking. Say speaking. Speaking. If you don't speak in tongues, no fill. You may have spoken when they prayed for you, but if you haven't spoken in tongues in a while, no filling. But you, my beloved, you, my beloved, build up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another, psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The word heart is really cardia in the Greek. But spiritual songs is pneumaticos, which means it's a spiritual song. It is not something you're just kind of listening on the radio. So there you have it, my friends. I like going in and out. I get free refills, don't you? How many just buy their drink once and just, that's it. I'm not going back for any more extras. But you get a, you get something going on and you're sucking on that straw and you hit the tumblers. You know, you just have to go over to the dispenser. Oh, woo. it's the same with the Holy Spirit. You know, you're dry and hitting the rocks. Speaking. Speaking, everybody say speaking. You got to speak in tongues to get filled with the Spirit. You don't spend time speaking in the Spirit. You're not getting full of the Spirit, which is a command. So it's not a one and done. You walk it out in power. So what a privilege we have. We get to pray beyond our abilities. We get to obey God beyond our abilities. And we get to worship God beyond our abilities. Thank you for listening. I want to pray right now. David's going to lead us in a worship song. Let's let the Holy Spirit work in us a little bit. I want to thank you for joining us today at Hope Chapel, Huntington Beach. It's our desire to bring the teachings of this church to others globally. If today's message has brought you closer to Jesus, we want to know. Can you send us an email to office at HopeChapelHB? Org. Would you consider supporting this ministry financially? You can give securely online at hopechapelhb.org slash give. If a check is your preferred method, you can send a mailed check to Hope Chapel, P.O. Box 548, Huntington Beach, California, 92648. If you want to be contacted by Hope Chapel, would you consider subscribing to our weekly newsletters at hopechapelhb.org slash subscribe. Whatever season of life you're in, we want to go through it with you. We want to thank you once again for joining us, and God bless you.